Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Admiral Ramdas and we're going to discuss first the India-Pakistan standoff which has been going on for quite some time in the context that North Korea and United States can discuss nuclear issues. Why can't India and Pakistan? Admiral Ramdas, you've written about it recently that there is a reason why India and Pakistan should talk about both the geostrategic issues, the fact that they are there are, shall we say, tensions of different kinds within the two countries, but particularly because both are nuclear power states. Well, how should we look at this nuclear standoff in the midst of this kind of tensions? You know, this reminds me of uh, the year 2000, when uh, there was this great uh, standoff between India and Pakistan. And even to go to Lahore from Delhi, one had to go fly to Dubai and then come the back door entry and finally go to Pakistan. And uh, it was very bad, the situation was grim. We thought we were going to have a breakout, a war between India and Pakistan and all that sort of stuff. And as it happened, we had the Agra summit soon thereafter, as you know. And uh, it was a very good turn. And nobody had expected anything of that kind, but it all happened. I think uh, some lessons we did learn from history, at least I thought I did. And I feel that now is yet again another golden opportunity for both our countries to reopen the talk. After all, there is no alternative. Uh, except for a dialogue, especially we are very, very powerfully armed weapons on both the sides. And any, it's not just going to necessarily war alone, nuclear weapons by themselves are hazardous. And nowadays, and you can have some wrong design, something going wrong somewhere. And when it explodes, even accidentally or unwittingly, there won't be anybody to say what happened. And it could be mistaken even as a first strike by the neighbor. Absolutely. And particularly when there is no understanding between the two. So what better than talking to each other, a dialogue. And we already have some, you know, confidence building measures. But unfortunately, everything has been put on the back burner. We don't even want to say something officially. So I feel that uh, it is so much more important now than ever before. And luckily we have got away with, I think, two decades of uh, possessing these weapons between both India and Pakistan. In, in fact, in May, it was exactly 20 years for both the countries and I think and both countries spending going fast forward as it were in you know adding to the inventory and I think it's a very dangerous sign and any amount of talk or any other means is vital for the survival of this region to begin with and which in turn, I'm sure, now that you know, we're linked up with the United States, the largest nuclear weapon power on the one side. Pakistan linked up with China, which is between the two of them, again, a very hugely armed weapon state. I mean, the combination is deadly and you can't restrain it. You, know, you, you were also talking about the nuclear weapons by themselves becoming being so dangerous. Yeah. And uh, also the fact that, as we all now know, the U.S. and the uh, Soviet Union came to accidental uh, possibilities of nuclear weapons yeah. uh, being dropped, yeah. sometimes mistakenly being yeah. thought of as an yeah, attack, yeah. sometimes accidents happening where all the sort of safeguards went off and only by almost accident that the nuclear weapons did not explode. Mm. So all this history is known. 
and this with two powers who probably had more maturity in terms of the nuclear te weapons technology than we apparently seem to have. But also the fact that we are so near each other, that there is really no response time involved. It has become more or less a status symbol um, that I have an ICBM or you have a ballistic missile which will be continental or intercontinental. The thing to remember in this whole uh, uh, system is that we have to, whether we like it or not, respect the fact that these are highly, highly dangerous weapons. You may think that it has a deterrent value, even now that is, but you don't need so many in there, hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands, which, which, <laughs> which both Americans and the Russians, uh, I mean, the, and now of course Russians realized then, of course, the Soviet Union and United States, the division in the war, Cold War time. So today, the risks are, if anything, much, more. much, much more. And the, <laughs> How many times can you blow yourself uh, out of shape? I don't know. Uh, but you don't need many. <laughs> that is the lesson now. Admiral Ramdas, you have written that you were once a votary of nuclear weapons when you were in service. What made you change your mind? Well, I think two events in my life made me do that. Um, the first one was, as uh, perhaps many people may or may not know, in 1971 war, I was in the Eastern Theater, commanding the naval frigate called Bias. And halfway through all these proceedings, you know, inputs, one of the inputs was that the American 7th Fleet, which had been equipped with aircraft carriers and so on, the USS Enterprise and its team are entering Malacca Straits and are their way are on their way to the bay to come and intervene and interfere with uh, our operations at the head of the bay, which was really East Pakistan. Of course, uh, at that time I was told by the fleet commander, I was, and that was their plan. They said, Whoosh! and I was the junior most <laughs> at the time. Not that it mattered. So I, I turned and I went towards, uh, they said, they told me, you, you go <laughs> and stop those fellows from coming. This is like, <laughs> you know, in go peg the bar. So that. one small frigate no, was going to throw the whole yeah. seventh fleet out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out I, I, the and Bay USS America. Enterprise, those days was the biggest uh, aircraft carrier in the world and two uh, sets of squadrons and this and that. So they steamed in and w I went completely silent. I mean, in more ways than one. <laughs> but uh, as we went south, I could monitor and all. So I said, yeah, ye to. this is not a very happy note. Because, I said, I've got 270 whatever number of men and people. We went in that direction. And we were listening on listening watch, purely, and Americans love to chatter. They love to natter and chatter. So the aeroplanes flying at a height, talking to each other, not us, <laughs> theirs. That, you know, yeah, it's all clear, yeah, well, naturally I was long way away. You can hear, um, I knew exactly, we were guessing at that time, but we knew roughly where they could be and where they would be, uh, still going. At that time, of course, luckily, the, the remaining whatever forces that we had, and even we didn't expect such a rapid thing. And again, a course mate of mine had descended and uh, got sorted out of General Niazi and so on. So Dhaka was captured. Oh, yes. Uh, we. We managed to get most of the information uh, and they were nattering away. So I said, we were still going, getting closer. I would estimate we were about 150 to 200 miles away, nautical miles away, approximately. 
Uh, now, don't ask me how uh, we managed to hear uh, that range at the, in those days. That is 1971, almost 40 years ago. Um, uh, and so, as you were, and luckily, as I said, the land battle was sorted out. And by the time I was, I turned back, and uh, they said, "It's all over. <laughs> you can come back now." Later, if you read uh, the book, both written by Zumwalt uh, and uh, by Admiral Nanda, who's no more, he was asked this question: What would you have done if the U.S. fleet had actually managed to come in, and uh, if your ship? So he was uh, gracious enough to say, "Look, one of our ships went to make contact with your force." Uh, and uh, nothing to fight. What is there to fight with the American Navy? Um, he would have invited your captain of the Enterprise to come and have a drink with him. <laughs> so, you know the. So, did you feel that confronting the yeah, U.S. You see, you Enterprise, see that, you know, one thing, need for nuclear weapons? One thing was clear that you know here was a nuclear arsenal. With aeroplanes, and delivery systems, you know, this is the knowledge we had at the time. And whether or not they will use it, not I knew that they may not use it, but it was still a threat. I mean, I have to, I'm at the receiving end with nothing to say this. So, and as we all know, historically, in 74, we had our own peaceful nuclear explosion. And that is history. That is point number one. So it made me little. I can't be such a uh, stupid man to say we should say no to this at that time. Although in my mind I felt differently, but I said, well, you know. The second one point is that it is many people don't understand or don't or pretend that they don't understand that it is important that. Uh, we have a system which is capable of doing something or the other, especially with the submarine. I'm now really in my mind. And a submarine has, is a very versatile weapon system. And um, we were doing some work and I was being helpful. But then we had said, that we have demonstrated the capability. And needless to say, we were a couple of screwdriver turns from putting things together in a hurry if required. That's how we left it. And you will notice that we never had a single test after our first one until 98. Although I think once or twice the scientific community wanted to do some more tests. Oh, every time a new prime minister came, they would go and apply for the well, you know, uh, test. That was the apparently that used to be always the case. Yeah, and and this was something. At that time, it was not for without uh, warning the system or something. But okay, you acquiesced. I said I acquiesced also, and I felt maybe I am still you know don't have enough. And quite honestly, at that time, even all the chiefs didn't know that this is going on between, push, push, between, whatever. It happened. And then, then 98, we all know what happened. Then I said, now, this is offside. Although the manifesto of the um, BJP, had BJP said at that time was uh, wanting this weapon, and they said, well, no question of anything. Uh, <laughs> Overt or covert, and within a, well, I forget the dates now, but within Six, a fortnight or so, in the same yeah. month, towards the end of May, I think Pakistan did the same thing. And uh, nobody expected that. And the government was, uh, the political people, masters, scientists, everybody thought, hey, but hey was ho. And then, you know, and of course, I was out by then. And then I said, now this is really pointless too. Because frankly, uh, economically, it is an 
I, as I say, it's very costly and it's a bit of a disaster. Politically, it is counterproductive because you, you may show off, but after a while, that status symbol goes. And militarily, it is uh, absolutely ineffective because you kill civilians with that weapon. And with both the nuclear arms of the issue. And uh, further. I said morally and ethically also, it is totally wrong, incorrect. So that's when you decided so the, and, to come and, and, out. And, and I said that, you know, this is all has to go. And that made me then completely convinced that this weapon is useless. You spend so much money on this and you are not going to get anything out of it. You just put it on a shelf and then just to look after it, you require so many well, uh, accessories and addendums. Uh, and at the end of 25, 30 years, you say, no, no, it has to be upgraded. Everybody is. And it's all these things are revenue expenses. Uh, bulk itself, of course, it's never been disclosed in India, whether it is this government, that government, any other government. Nobody has said how much money this all costs because we never have any defense white paper to tell us strategic weapons, what are they? For the audience, uh, in fact, I was part of the uh, peace meeting or the meeting in which we talked against nuclear weapons, where Admiral Ramdas came first to declare his opposition mm. to nuclear weapons. That is that correct. Was, that was, that is absolutely that was correct. 98. That was the first, first uh, publicly I... Publicly. Yeah, and, and that was just five years since I retired. Yes. Even then I was disappointed. Um, the initiative who truly, you know, India for so many years had always in public and otherwise in United Nations and elsewhere, we demanded the disarmament of all nuclear weapons and have always been. And Rajiv Gandhi was the only head of state who actually put forth in the United Nations a plan. 1988. To say that this is what it is. Even in the 60s, all the war gaming that had been done had shown that a limited exchange is not going to happen. It is going to end up in total exchange. They also decided that tactical nuclear weapons would lead to nuclear exchange. It did not work. And that's why really the SALT Treaty and the ABM Treaty came out. But why is it that there is at least not even the talk of any restraint in terms of nuclear weapons between India and Pakistan? And do you think that it's because there is now on both sides, and now even on India's side, the argument that if you wave the big stick enough, that the other side will back down, in spite of the fact that it has not happened ever? In fact, the, it's, it's, I'm glad you mentioned this, because this is precisely what uh, Trump thought that he might do with North Korea. And North Korea, being North Korea, as I said, they have come over many years of all this technology which has been transferred either legally, illegally, whichever way you look at it. And anyway, all technology of this kind should be considered illegal. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's a good point. But then, Nowadays, who worries about legality or illegality? Even the United Nations is treated in scant respect. Um, so, uh, when you ask that question that, you know, isn't it so at that time and what is it now today? This scene is very, very similar. But then you have Trump going, as I said, to shake hands with uh, Mr. Kim Ching Jong, who they call himself. Uh, in Singapore, I mean, the government or the country with the largest number of uh, nuclear weapons, the biggest, toughest guy, but he's willing to come all the way to Singapore to shake hands with this gentleman who ordered, you know, the slaughter of his own commander in chief, but uh, neither here nor there. But why? Because the implications of and deployment and usage of weapons today and doctrines which are supposed to provide this inbuilt safety factor and so on. Whether you're one, 
10 or 3000. It's insane for anybody to even think that these can be used. That is one level. But then you create a kind of a peace atmosphere in that region, which is in Korea, very close to Japan, very close to China. So it interested both China and the United States to make peace in that region. Let's be but, clear what's happening. Yeah, Once yeah. North Korea has the ability to reach United States with ICBM yeah. and it has hydrogen bombs so you can actually make the weapon smaller, nobody's going to take a risk of whether they really that sure. can do it or not. Sure. And China is interested because if North Korea is attacked with nuclear weapons, well, the part of North China, of, of, of course, the China yeah. also goes. So it is in the interest of both to really ratchet it down. Absolutely. If it is of interest for them, so should it be of interest for us in Pakistan. Yeah. I mean, it's obvious. It, it, it just falls on your lap and you do nothing about it and just uh, jingoism and <laughs> machoism, whether it is here or across the border uh, line, whatever you call it, is, is uh, total insanity because half a weapon, whether it's tactical weapon, a strategic weapon, small weapon, this capability, that capability means nothing. It doesn't make any sense and it's high time we grab this opportunity. I feel it's an opportunity. And somebody should take the initiative and obviously it has to be us. We are the bigger power, therefore it and, is and, and the bigger we responsibility. We still claim we are a democracy. So let's show them how democracy works. Like US had the chivalry or gallantry or whatever you may say, or good sense that they came all the way, no less than Trump himself to Singapore probably the smallest but most safe part in the world. So he came to meet. We can have a meeting if you like in Singapore. Or in Sri Lanka. If you don't want uh, in Lahore or in Delhi or Islamabad or wherever, they have it in Singapore. So what? We're going to talk. So therefore I'm saying talk you must. There is no alternative. That's the fundamental message. That, that is, and, I, and that can only happen, not yet, but when artificial intelligence comes in, that will also perhaps happen, I don't know. But now I hope human intelligence should come to push India to take the initiative, and I feel it's a very good opportunity to do so. Thank you very much, Admiral Ramdas, to be with us. This is all the time we have today for News Click. Do keep watching News Click. Visit our YouTube channel and also our webpage.